Thank you so much. And it's a, a privilege to be able to speak at this conference. I hope you can all hear me. Um, just as my background, I was the Director of Action on Smoking and Health in the UK. I'm a former senior civil servant uh, coming after that, and I now run uh, Counterfactual Consulting, which is my own sustainability and public health consultancy. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest uh, to declare. Um, hold on. Just um, right. Um, so I'm, we've talked a bit about the uh, technology uh, issues and the options, the science and everything. What I want to discuss is the perceptions, what people actually understand uh, about these products and what some of the challenges are. Um, I'm going to draw a bit on uh, the approach taken in the United States by the FDA, um, but I'll bring in some other insights uh, on the way. Um, the first thing I should say is that we have to be um, we we have to be clear about this. There are there are these new categories of products. I put them in these four bands: um, pure nicotine products, uh, tobacco products, heated and unheated products. That basically is my segmentation. But more or less, they all have one thing in common. Uh, well, they all have one thing in common, which is there's no combustion. There's therefore no products of combustion and therefore they expose the users to vastly lower levels of toxins, you know, uh, one to three orders of magnitude lower. Um, they are bound beyond any reasonable doubt to be much less hazardous to health. The question is, how do we get that across to people and what do people think about these products? And this is an area where the data is really quite depressing. And I'm going to use American data again. Um, and you can see here, um, I've, I've put up the numbers uh, for smokeless tobacco, uh, which show that uh, only 12.5%, one in eight Americans think that smokeless tobacco uh, is um, less dangerous than smoking. Um, there's no real doubt about that. All, all the science says, you know, you know around 1% of the risk of smoking. So, but only 12.5%, one in eight get that. For vaping, uh, is electronic cigarettes safer? Only 3.6% say, um, say much less harmful. And, uh, you know, approaching 50%, one in two, think as harmful or much, or as harmful, more harmful, or much more harmful, which is an incredible result because the difference is so large. It's probably 5% or less of the harm of smoking. Um, People think that nicotine is the hazardous agent in uh, smoking. People are terrified of nicotine, and therefore they're terrified of vaping, which is a way of delivering nicotine without the smoke. And here again, we have terrible numbers. Around half think that nicotine is the substance that causes most of the cancer caused by smoking. It's not true. That is not what, do what does it. As Michael Russell said, um, it's the tar, not the nicotine. People smoke for the nicotine and die from the tar. So we have a terrible starting place here. The question is, what can we do to get people back to having a better understanding so that they'll then be able to take more, uh, more rational decisions? Uh, let, let's look at the uh, Tobacco Control Act from the United States. This is interesting because it does allow manufacturers to make claims about risk. Um, in the European Union Tobacco Products Directive, you simply can't make any differentiated claims about risk for any tobacco product at all, unless you go out and get a medicines, um, um, a medicines authorization and a, a therapeutic claim. So the, the Tobacco Control Act of the US allows three types of claim, a lower risk of tobacco related disease, um, a lower uh, level of a substance or reduced exposure to toxicants um, or um, the absence of uh, toxicants, saying it doesn't contain or is free of a substance that you would find in smoking. Now, basically, I've, I've headed this as this wrong basis for risk communication, but actually, I think this framework is, is quite good. It, it allows different types of, of claim and different types of uh, restrictions and constraints to be placed on people and different burdens of evidence to be used to make those claims. So what's the problem? 
Okay, well, I'll tell you what I think the problem is. The problem is risk communication is designed to inform consumers and to help them make good decisions about uh, product choices. But what we've got here is something that really is designed to control what companies say. Um, it's really focused on rationing and controlling what companies say. So it's possible to have two almost identical products. And if one company decides it can't make the claim because it's too expensive to do the work, then no information is provided about that. Um, if the companies um, don't choose not to think it's cost effective to, to make these claims at all, then no claims are made and no information is provided to the public. And I think that's a major weakness. One of the it's unbelievably expensive to make these uh, cases to the FDA. The Philip Morris International case, just to make a re reduced exposure claim, uh, would have had anyone been daft enough to print it out, it would have been a, a paper pile 100 meters high. And that was after um, FDA sent 300 meters of paperwork back to PMI saying they didn't need it. Okay, so these are just gigantic exercises, which are in practice only open to the largest tobacco companies and only open to those companies who believe that the economics work out. So Swedish Match has um, um, a, an MRTP claim that it can make, a reduced risk claim that it can make, but is it worth it? Uh, they have to not only spend the money up front, but they also have to do continuous monitoring and assessment how many extra packs of snus does Swedish Match have to sell for that to be worthwhile for the corporate bottom line? And the answer is a huge amount. And I'm not sure they, we, or anyone is convinced that it makes sense to do that. Let's go on and look at one of the problems here, uh, which I will just summarize briefly as saying, uh, it's a lot easier to say no uh, to a claim than it is to say yes. Um, and I'll use this framework briefly, let's not go into this, but look, we have, um, we, what we have to do is look at what's real and what's allowed, uh, okay? So if we have a valid claim and the FDA approves it, that's good. If, if the claim is invalid and the claim is rejected, that's also good. But here we go. What happens if the claim is invalid and approved? And what happens if the claim is valid but rejected? And my view is that regulators tend to focus on the top right-hand corner of that box. They're much more worried about saying yes to something that's wrong than they are saying no to something that's right. Yet saying no to something that's right deprives the user of information. And it means that essentially the default is that they just pick up whatever they hear in the media, uh, they pick up all the scare stories, or they default to the existing position, which is that most people think that reduced risk products are no less harmful than e-cigarettes. And this is about the culture of saying yes and saying no. It's about loss aversion that you find in all regulators. Um, let's go on to the next thing here, which I call materiality. These are warnings that are put on uh, smokeless tobacco products in the United States. Um, this product can cause gum disease and this, this product can cause mouth cancer. I think the point I'm trying to make here is you put these warnings on, you make them very bold and very large. The implication is that these risks themselves must be quite large. Now, it's very, very difficult to prove an absence of a risk that this product doesn't cause gum disease, doesn't cause tooth loss and doesn't cause mouth cancer. Um, but the, the problem is, if you can't do that, you have these warnings on the packs, which instinctively, intuitively apply the risks are quite high. And that is not supported by the science. So it's not just what you say, it's what the magnitude and style of warning com, com, conveys about the magnitude of risk. And in, with these warnings, because they're there at all, the risks are quite high. There are plenty of products that have risks you know, you can cut your arm off in a lawnmower. You can choke on bacon. You know, you, you, can, uh, you can suffer um, coronary heart disease if you eat too much cheese. These are all risks, but they're not risks that we see fit to place a warning like this on the pack. 
And when you do place a warning like that on the pack, you're suggesting some kind of magnitude or materiality to the risk. Okay, let's look at the next problem, which I call mangled messages. So this is where we started with a, a warning on uh, snus or smokeless tobacco. This product is not a safe alternative to cigarettes. Now, this is one of those communication messages that fall into the category of true but misleading because it implies when listened by the audience, when listened to by the audience, that snus products are no different really to cigarettes. That's what's heard. It may not be what's intended or literally what's said, but what's heard is that there's no safety dividend here. The companies proposed an alternative. No tobacco product is safe, but this product presents substantially lower risk to health than cigarettes. To the writers, um, but this is what came out. Using general snus instead of cigarettes put you a lower risk of mouth cancer, heart disease, lung cancer, um, stroke, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis. To me, this is the worst kind of message because it implies that there's risks that weren't even thought of in the first place. Who thinks that general snus or any snus causes lung cancer, bronchitis, or emphysema? No one does that, but the new warning suggests that the, the, the risk is just a bit lower. So it's misleading, in my opinion. We've got this one in the EU. This product contains nicotine, which is a highly addictive substance, not used for, uh, not recommended for use by non-smokers. Yeah, it may be addictive. I'm not sure it's highly addictive, but what's the effect on the user's view of safety? Remembering when we go back and look at the numbers that almost half of people think that nicotine is the thing that causes cancer, not just the addictive substance. And here's some data from the UK. Let's look at the top row here, okay? The main reason for not trying e-cigarettes, I, I don't want to substitute one addiction for another, okay? So what effect does that warning actually have? It's more likely to keep people where they are using cigarettes. They don't believe the e-cigarettes are harmful uh, or less harmful, and they think they're just as addictive as smoking. What's the point in switching? Uh, let's look at how these warnings evaluate. Here's a bit of academic research. Our findings suggest that the Tobacco Products Directive, nicotine addiction e-cigarette health warning may reduce smokers' willingness to use and likelihood of purchasing an e-cigarette. It functions as a protection for the cigarette trade. It keeps people using cigarettes. It's completely perverse and counterproductive. Um, another brief example, we saw uh, in 2019 an outbreak of lung injuries associated with the use of e-cigarettes vaping products, okay? Look at what they called it. Lung injury associated with the use of e-cigarettes or vaping products became known as Ivali. Um, okay, associated with e-cigarettes and vaping products. Turned out it was nothing to do with those products. It was to do with cannabis vapes that were sold illegally that had a cutting agent called vitamin E acetate. Yet the effects were dramatic. Here was an evaluation of what happened as a result of that communication from the CDC in the United States. The impact of the first information shot was to increase the fraction of respondents who thought e-cigarettes were more harmful than smoking, more harmful than smoking, by about 16 percentage points. It, that miscommunication took the risk perceptions in the wrong direction for the wrong reasons, for no reason at all. Scandalous in my view. Um, and even now, uh, I'm gonna hurry up, even now CDC uh, refuses to be clear about this. They refuse to rule out other causes than this vitamin E acetate uh, from cannabis vapes, yet there is no other cause. Um, the EU approach, as I say, is all wrong. Uh, you can't even make differentiated claims uh, in the EU. So what is the right approach? The, the approach that I uh, like would be to be candid about things, to use um, some of those messages that we saw used by snooze producers in the United States, or to simply inform consumers that this product is likely to be at least 95% safer than smoking cigarettes. What a change that would make in the messaging to smokers about 
whether it's a good idea to shift. Um, no product is completely safe, but use of this product is much less harmful than smoking. So another way of communicating the risk without sounding complacent about it. The Canadians did a good thing. They never brought it into effect, but the government approved a whole series of risk-related statements. Um, and I won't go through them all, but they essentially took their understanding of the science of the whole category, not just individual products from individual manufacturers, and said, look, these are statements that you could use. Now, unfortunately, this proposal was derailed and has never come into effect, but it would have been a really good way of doing it, in my view. And then finally, the approach taken in England is to advertise on television that using an e-cigarette is a good way of stopping smoking. So it's not just communication through what's in the pack, it's a creating a broad environment of communication. The option ideals. Uh, and this is the Public Health England campaign that runs on television. So with that, I am going to stop my remarks. Uh, there's a summary to the left. And Thank you very much. I will uh, hand back to our chair.